Praise God. We'll be in John chapter 14, verses 8 through 13. But before we read that, I wanted to kind of just review a little bit about what we preached the last time I preached. Because I feel like the Lord has me on the heart of the Father. Amen. And uh, I think we're going to be here for a little bit. I don't even know where it's going to go. I kind of have an idea what he's been putting on my heart, where to go from here. But we're going to we're going to be camping out with the Father uh, for, for a little bit. Praise God. So last week we, we went out of Psalm chapter 2 and then it was interesting because the Lord had put the same thing on Aaron's heart when he was in the Philippines. So we got a good dose of Psalm 2. But one of the main emphasis in Psalm 2 has to do with the rebellion that is going against God. If you'll remember that. One of the, why do the nations rage? Or why do the heathen rage? Why do the people plot in vain? The kings set themselves and the, and the people, they, they set themselves against God and against his anointed and they say, hey, let us cut his cords from us. Let us burst his bands asunder. In other words, mankind doesn't want to be told by anyone on what they are to do and what they are to do and that there's a spirit of rebellion because of the fall and that the nations, and not just the nations, but the people are against God. And that God's answer to that was his son. He said, today I have begotten you. Amen. And, and, and that his son is his king and his son is his Messiah. And this is thousand, a thousand years before Jesus ever showed up. But we see that God's plan was to send his son and that ultimately he said, kiss the son. And I was thinking, you know, is there anything more intimate than a kiss? No, I mean, I'm not trying to get too, too overly dramatic here, too technical. I'm not trying to get too intimate from behind the pulpit. But look, is there anything really more selfless and intimate than a kiss? I'm just talking about a kiss, and it just stops with a kiss. You see what I'm getting at? Because a lot of times, the kisses... Kisses are only used whenever things are going to move forward and there, there's some level of self-gratification. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Am I talking too, too big for younger people? But what I'm trying to get in, I'm going to just leave it like that. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that a simple kiss that shows how much love and how much affection and how much intimacy and how much selflessness. And when they say kiss the sun, it's, it talks about a touch and it talks about a soft touch and it talks about, it's talking about humility. It's talking about a level of humility, of humbling yourself, humbling oneself under the Son of God, under humbling yourself under the hand of God who, who allowed himself to become man upon the earth. And this is God's way. God's way is his Son, and he's saying, kiss the Son. And he says this, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. The reality of it is, is that there's a lot of, that the world is unwilling to kiss the Son. And when I say the world, I, I'm not saying that you're of the world. You, I, I'm, I, I'm not saying that you, whoever's watching, you're going to watch my videos of the world. It's not my job to determine who's the world and who's the church. That's the Holy Spirit. It's not, not my job to determine who's wheat and who's tares. But what I am trying to say is this, is that when a person is converted and the Holy Spirit moves into their heart, the Word of God says you're a child of God. And a child of God should understand the glory that is, that is deserving to Jesus. But the world is never going to kiss the sun. The world is going to think that a statement like that sounds weird. But I'm here to tell you that in the father's eyes, he demands that his son be kissed. And as we move forward in some of this series, it's going to end up at some point in time morphing into the nations raging against God. The rebellion that's against God. The, 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 the entities and the darkness that's against God because it's all throughout the scripture. And at some point in time, we'll move into that. And it's important that you know, though, that we're not in a struggle against flesh and blood. We're in a war against, against the forces of darkness. It's, under, it's important that you understand that the forces of darkness are against the God you serve. But it's also important to understand that the forces of darkness are against you to prevent you from serving God, to prevent you from kissing the sun. The, the forces of darkness don't want you to bow down in homage to the sun. The forces of darkness want you to hold on to yourself, to stand upright, to poke your chest out, to straighten out your shoulders, come on, and to say, no, I am man and I stand without God. See, that's the rebellion that is, that is in the world. That's the rebellion that is against the truth of God, but I want you to know that his son is his victory over evil. It's a beautiful plan. 
But if you had read the word of God from the beginning to the end on more than one occasion and you started to catch on to the thread that runs through, you would begin to realize God was not taken by surprise by any of this stuff. And that God had a plan far in advance and that his plan for victory over evil was the sending of his son and that through death he gained victory through death in the resurrection. We see the power, amen, that the devil doesn't win in the end. And the question is, is he going to win in your life? Or is he going to win in your life? Or is Jesus going to win in your life? Amen? Praise God. And, and, and so within this, and one part of what I was talking about, I was saying, you know, we need to keep these truths about a son and his father. Because I want you to know that the father has lovingly reinserted himself into the fallen earth in an intimate way through his son. God the Father has revealed himself intimately to the world through his Son. And then we talked about it last time about how the Word of God is filled with familial terminology, right? Bridegroom, bride, children, offspring, seed, amen. And we see this throughout. And we see the repeated uh, terminologies about rebellion versus righteousness. And we see that in the first creation, Adam came in rebellion. And we see in the last Adam, Jesus came in righteousness. And, and the scripture talks about this. It says that whoever does not practice, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. And so he says, he says, it is evident who are the children of God. Those who are the children of the dead and those who are the children of the devil. And he says, those who do not practice righteousness are not the children of God. And those that do not love their brother. <laughs> and these are important passages of scripture for us to understand and to hear. We should hear these words probably pretty often to provoke us. And to understanding that, that, that the true children of God practice righteousness. <laughs> now when I say that, let me just be clear on this. You can't practice righteousness in your own strength. Amen. You, you cannot practice righteousness in your own strength. That's right. You don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to serve God today. No, the Lord's been dealing with your heart. And finally, when the time is right, the Lord breaks your heart and you bow down. And you kiss the son, then, then, and you truly get converted. Now the Holy Spirit moves on the inside of your heart. And as you learn to yield through the finished work of what Jesus did at the cross, which gives you access to grace, the empowering grace of God, he empowers you to be able to live a life of righteousness. Yeah. Amen. So he's not asking you to do anything in your own strength. And as a matter of fact, if you try to live for God, a life of righteousness in your own strength, the Bible says in Galatians, you're going to frustrate the grace of God. Amen. And, you're, and it's going to be worse than what it was before Christ. I mean, well, it's going to be bad. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Amen. But he has his own peculiar people. You remember we use that word? Peculiar to make around, and it's a peculiar people that he's separating. It's not weird. <laughs> no, it's not, that's what the word means today. Weird. It's not weird. It's separate. And I, I remember I drew it. I tell y'all, one of my first messages I ever preached in this church on a Christmas, I believe it was a that first service. I drew the little dot and I put the circle around it, and that's what the word means in the Greek to make around. It means it's to hedge off of people. God has separated out of people from the world. That, that are his own, that are to bring him glory and honor. True Christians are separated from the world. It doesn't mean you don't work with the world. It doesn't mean that you're not acquaintances with the world. We're not talking about isolation. We're talking about separation. And the people of God do not act like the world. Amen. 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 Because the spirit of God is on the inside of them and, and driving them and ministering to them, pleading with them. That they would live differently. Yes. Amen? Amen? God's, God's, the family of God is a special kind of people. And I said this last week. It's a family of sons because this family is created in and through the son. Amen? Amen? And the more they die, talking about us, the more the image of his glorious son is formed in them. And that's kind of where I want to pick up. I want to say that again. That the more you and I die to ourselves, our flesh, our, our natural birth, the more Mad Abair dies to Mad Abair, the more 
the Son of the Father begins to become revealed through Amen. this vessel. Amen. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? And, and this isn't, listen, maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I need, I'm going to use a big church word. Sanctification. I know most of y'all have heard that, but some of y'all maybe haven't heard the word sanctification. I don't know. But, but let me just say this. The word sanctification means to be made separate and it means to be made holy. And I need you to understand that if you're truly saved this morning, you've already been sanctified in this, that you have the Holy Spirit in you. Yeah. And when the Holy Spirit lives in you, it makes you different than the world yeah. because the world doesn't have the Holy Spirit in them. The, the Bible is very clear on that. The, the Holy Spirit is not in those that have not been born again. But then once you're born again, now there's an ongoing life journey where, where you begin to die to yourself and your actions become separated from the world around you. You become, you begin to look more like Jesus and less like your old you. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? And it's a process. And this is the thing. If you belong to the Lord, if you're in business with God, I got to tell you, you're in for a rude awakening if you think you're just going to get away with living your life the way you want to. Amen. Bad news for you, my friend. <laughs> now, you may not even be a true child of God. I mean, I'm just saying, like, this is a relatively small group of people, but I'm just saying, if you're not born again and the Holy Ghost doesn't live in you, then you're not a child of God. And if you're not a child of God, then you may not be dealing with you as much. Okay, but I'm just here to tell you this, is that if God got his hand on you and you're trying to run from him, it gets ugly. Yeah. Yeah. How you know, preacher? Trust me. <laughs> it gets ugly. So I'm just trying to let you know. All that confusion, all that chaos you got going on on the inside of you, don't think it's bad luck. Don't get me to pray over your bad luck, my friend. No, no, no. I might pray that, I re that our rebellious heart would be broken in the presence of the Lord and that we yield to Him. Because guess what? The bad stuff in life don't stop happening. It's going to rain on the good and it rains on the bad. The difference is peace. He brings a peace that surpasses understanding. Hallelujah. In the midst of your trial, in the midst of your tribulation, with everything going on, he'll give you the peace and the strength and the grace that you need to hold you up, to stand you up, to keep you on your feet, and to give you strength in spite of it all. It's called endurance and it's called steadfastness. And it's not just because you was raised by, by a man that was a marine because none of that's going to last when it comes to spiritual things because you ain't fighting the devil in the flesh. I'm talking about spiritual steadfastness, spiritual endurance that only comes through his son. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, let's read John chapter 14. If you, if you feel like it, now we've had a little bit of a, a time if you want to stand with me as we read, now I don't feel like we're as much in a, in quite in a, a, a Catholic mass because of the fact that we had a little bit of time in between. Lord, forgive me. Lord, I don't think it was wrong. But... <laughs> Philip said to him, we're in, we're in John 14, verse 8, and I'm in the ESV version of the Bible. It says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Before you sit down, can you transition to Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 for me real quick? We're just going to read three more verses. We'll pray and then we'll move forward. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 9 through 12 says, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone, for it was fitting that he for whom and 
by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word, O Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would use me this morning as an oracle, just a mouth to speak forth your truth. Lord, I pray that you would remove me, Lord, that I would be out of the equation. Lord God, and that you would speak, Lord, that your word would go forth. Lord, that it would have an impact in people's hearts and in their lives, Lord, that it would transform them, O oh Lord. And we give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So in the first passage there, he said, show us the Father. Philip said, show us the Father. And Jesus said, did you not know, Philip, that I'm in the Father and that the Father's in me and that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then in the second passage, it talked about the fact that, that Jesus uh, is not ashamed to call them. And he's talking about you brothers, talking about the congregation, those that are the people of God. Jesus became he, he he became our brother in that sense and so we also know that he's the bridegroom and we're the bride but this morning the title of my message is this he is my brother's father i'm gonna say it again he is my brother's father and 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 god's will and my, and my main point in my message really this morning is, is that we can't that is this is that we cannot know the father except through the son I can't know the Son who is the living Word unless the Holy Spirit reveal Him through the written Word. And so we need, I need help this morning to communicate to you what I believe that the Lord is putting on my heart. It is of utmost necessity that you and I learn the heart of our Father and that we're not going to be able to ever understand our Father unless we really understand Jesus. And that's really my main point this morning. Amen. I do want to say this. It's all about intimacy with God. I don't know about you, but I'm very grateful that I have the ability to have an intimate relationship with God. There's been times in my Christian walk where I haven't been as intimate. Amen. And then there's been times when I have been, I believe, very intimate with the Lord. And it's all about his grace. It's not about anything about me. You know, I've had a few people recently say, man, you know, you're such a man of God. And, and, I, and I appreciate all that. But let me just say this. If you can see what God sees, you may not think that. I'm just being real. If you can see everything about Matt Abraham from the beginning to the end and all points in between, you may not really think that. But I do know this. I know that I serve an awesome God. Amen. I serve an awesome God. And he's done great things in my life. And for that, I'm very, very grateful. Amen. So intimacy with God. And you know, the closest model that we have is family. I believe that. And more specifically, the family of God. And, and the church is supposed to be a fulfillment of the family of God on earth. And, and let, me, let me just kind of take a, a step back when I say that. The church is supposed to be a fulfillment of the family of God on earth. And I don't think that the American family, although I will say this, I'm not, I'm not here to beat up America. I want you to know that. I, I've said it once already today. I'm going to say it again. But even America in and of itself has changed so drastically since when I was a kid. Yep. And I'm not even saying it was a Christian America back then. But I can remember when we lived in this neighborhood, and I, I don't want to take up too much time with this, but when we lived in this neighborhood in Spring, Texas, and we had this community swimming pool out there. And I can remember even there was some guy, I was just a kid, man, riding my bike in the, in the neighborhood, and running around, and I asked this guy one time, I'm like, what you doing? What you doing, sir? I'm fixing this baseball backstop. I can remember when we'd go out on, on, on old Sawdust Road where that baseball field was, and we'd spend hours out there. Everybody's playing baseball. I'm like, hey, Mom, can I get a quarter to go get an Astro Pop or whatever? And it's just like it, it, life was so much more simple back then, and people actually conversed. People actually, there was community and there was relate. And I went back and I told my dad, there's some guy fixing the backstop at the, and you know, my dad was kind of funny guy, but he, I can remember he was sitting in the chair and he was watching football and normally he would just ignore me when I would try to talk during the football game. But he literally, I said, dad, you need to come help him. And, and he really, he got up. Dad got up. He's like, let's go over there, boy. 
from us. And he helped them fix the bad stuff. I'm just trying to say that times were so different then. And now everything's just become so selfish. And it's just all about me. And it's all about mine. And, and Lord, help us. And I'm not saying that. But at the same time, you see something like this happen. And you see people out there helping one another, right? They're helping their friends. They're helping their family. And they're helping their neighbors. I'm not here to preach an American gospel to you this morning. I'm here to preach Jesus. But I'm trying to make a, I'm, I am tr I'm trying to make a point that, that even as beautiful as an American family can be, that may skew our understanding of what a family really looks like in the eyes of God. And the closest thing that I can try to give you a picture of, an Amer of a godly family is the nation of Israel the way it was meant to be. I'm not saying the way it was, but the way it was meant to be. It was a nation made up of tribes, and the tribes were made up of clans, and the clans were made up of families. And the thing that all these people had in common together was that they were created by God and that they were called to worship God. So in God's mind, a family is a family that worships God. Amen. I'm not trying to say that a family has to come to church to worship God. You do what you want with that in your own mind, dude. I'm, I'm not over here trying to convince. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that when the true family of God is operating as a family that's serving God, I would imagine that families would be in the house of God because part of worshiping God is that you would be in the house of God to be together with the people of God. I'm, you're not going to convince me of different than that. We can agree to disagree on that. And, but, but, but when it's done right, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about religion that bangs its fist on the pulpit and says, if you're not in the house of God, you're going to. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a free will love offering that says, hallelujah. I'm going into the house of the God. Uh, God, and as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Praise God. And we're going to go into the house of God with joy in our heart. Thanksgiving in our heart. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. And I'm here to tell you that if we would learn to serve the Lord with faithfulness and truth, that it might not always go our way, but His peace. Yeah, man, so. That's right. His peace would be on our hearts and he would, he would begin to move on our hearts and give us hearts of thankfulness and, and gratitude. So do you understand what I'm saying with the nation and how it worked and that was God's plan. And the reason I'm saying that because I want us to understand that family is very important to God. And, and I believe it results in an understanding of, of how important it is to know the heart of Jesus so that we can know our Father. And, you know, some cultures, they vary somewhat slightly, but a lot of times there's identity connected to our families. You understand what I'm saying? We're looking, we're looking for identity some, on this earth. And, and we see ourselves in light of family a lot of times. And the way that something like that might be worded is, and I'm just kind of messing with it. I'm of the Bear clan. My name is Matt Bear, and I am Jimmy's boy. It was kind of funny. We were we had a party for my mom, her 90th birthday. Happy birthday, mom. And, and, and some of my dad's family came to the party at my sister's house. And I can hear him saying, he's just like Jimmy. He's just like Jimmy. You know, and so so they, they're connecting. They're connecting all that. I haven't seen these people in forever. He sounds like and he looks like he's just like your daddy. I'm like, okay. I'm over here trying to talk to another cousin on the other side of the family. Praise God. But hallelujah. I guess that's good. Yeah. I love my daddy. But 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 biblically it would sound like this. I'm from the tribe of Judah, a son of Jesse, and my name is David. See, there's a connection and an identity, right, Con connected to family, right? I used to have an uncle, and I remember one time he introduced me to somebody. He said, Matt, this is a Molly's aunt. This is your second cousin once removed. <laughs> what does that even mean? But, but I'm just trying to make a point that, that many times we connect ourselves and our identity is related to our family and even with our last names we connect it. So let, look, here's a, here's a definition of identity out of the Oxford American Dictionary. It's simple. The fact of being who or what a person or thing is. In other words, who you are or what you are. Identity. And you know, people identify in so many ways. Yeah. Right? And the question that I put on here is, how do we identify? 
How do you identify? How do, should the people of God identify with the world that they live in? And, you know, but this is how, this is what I wrote that I understand it. It's kind of a paragraph. I'm just going to read it to you real quick. It says this. This is how I, this is how I identify spiritually. You ready? I am a son of the creator of the universe. I am set apart from the created world, which has fallen in Adam. I am a new creation in Christ. Through faith, I identify with Jesus. I am one with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. I have been born again. I am a new creation. My original identity was dead to God and alive to sin. My new identity is alive to God and dead to sin. I am a son of God because I have been made accepted in his beloved son. Let me say that again. I am a son of God because I have been accepted in his beloved son, Ephesians 1, 6. I am part of the family of God. That's how I identify. My, and, and, and all my identification. Now listen, the world is trying to pull me out of that spot. But all of my identification is biblically supposed to be wrapped up in him. Wrapped up in his son. And family, again, is a beautiful thing on earth because it's a reflection of the Father's plan from, 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 from heaven. But, earth, but listen, earthly family, like everything else, can take on something else it was never intended to be. You ready? Let me say that again. Earthly family, like everything else, can take on something that it was never intended to be. Even in the lives of churchgoers. The concept of family can be big, can become bigger than Christ in our lives. You may not even agree with everything that I'm going to say, but I'm going to say this. I love my family, but I cannot let my family get between me and Jesus. Amen. Period. Amen. And if they do, the scripture says, he says that I am not worthy of him. That's right. Matthew 10, 37, Luke 14, 26 through 30. So. By the grace of God, my family is not going to get between me and my Jesus. So I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to cry out to them that the Lord would move on them and that he would pull them in. Amen? But there's, there's, I have to take my stand for Jesus. Jesus is my, he's the darling, he's the darling of heaven. He's the lover of my soul. You know, let me say this. This is not God's definition of biblical family. But you'll see this in churches. Y'all okay, ready? You'll see it in churches, but just because it's in the church doesn't mean it's God's definition of a biblical family. Moms with soccer kids. I'm sorry, soccer moms with kids. Or moms and their kids. Soccer, swim, dance, football, basketball. Oh, preacher, now you're preaching law. No, no, no. I didn't say that it's wrong for a kid to swim, go to dance, do any of these things. That's not what I said. What I said was, these things take on a life of their own. And a shift is taking place. People are like, oh no, I didn't put this before God. Okay, if, if you say so, that's between you and the Lord. I'm not your Holy Spirit. But I'm trying to tell you that this kind of stuff happens to people. It's happened to me at points in my life. Women in the church. I'm talking to church folk. How they are accepted within a larger group of women. They'll look for packs of women to see how they would be accepted. I mean, I don't know a lot about women. I'm not a woman, but I've worked with women all my life. I've been around a lot of women, and I've seen it. And listen, there's not a problem with a woman getting her nails done. But whenever, when I, listen, what I'm trying to say is the weird stuff starts happening whenever, whenever people are doing certain things culturally. And people start to judge one another based upon how, how your nails look. I mean, really, there are so many different fashions to fingernails that you can start splitting people off on what they believe according to their cultural preferences based on the way their fingernails look. I believe you can. Yeah. And you'll see you in a big enough church, you could literally go around and you can see, oh, look at them. You no, know, maybe not. Maybe I'm being extra, but you get the point. People, women, want to be accepted within a sometimes a larger group. Some people say, oh, I don't care about all that. Well, okay, but, but what I'm trying to get is this. A lot of times that happens, and, they, and people identify. Do I fit into this group? I, 
do I, I do is, and, they, and their identity is wrapped up in these kinds of things. Y'all understand what I'm saying? And if I'm rejected by this, then, then it makes me feel strange. And some people that are more so that way than others. Dads, as a provider, listen, I get it. Dads are supposed to be providers. As a matter of fact, the word of God says if you don't work, then you don't eat. <laughs> and the Bible says that eating doesn't work is worse than an infidel. So you're supposed to work if you can work. Amen? And you're supposed to, even in the Old Testament, when they had a provision for people that couldn't work, then guess what? They still had to work because they wouldn't cut the corners of their fields so that they could go and clean their own food. Amen? And so all I'm trying to say is this, is that it's important for a dad to be a provider. And, and, and let me say this, men will also get caught up in their work ethic. Man, I'll outwork anybody. I still hear people talk, talk about that to this day. Man, I'll outwork a young man, praise God. And look, I'm all about work ethic. I love working hard. I love to see when I'm working on the side, can I outdo them? I want to see. But, but you know, and, and so let me just say this. The scripture is clear. We're supposed to have a good work ethic. Colossians says it. Ephesians says it. That when you work, don't do it like with eye service as a man pleaser, but with signal and singleness of heart, fearing God, that you have a God in heaven that's a hard worker. God's a hard worker. And, and you know one of the things that I've noticed is this too, is that if I don't work hard, somebody else has to work harder. If the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, and you do feel the conviction of the Lord, then you're going to be convicted if you're slacking and other people are having to work harder because you're slacking. I got a text message. Is there any reason you can't work tomorrow, Thursday after the hurricane? I'll be there to work my shift. Hallelujah. If you're open and I'm scheduled by the grace of God, I'll be there to work my shift. Praise God. Because that's what we do. We do the right thing. Right? And, and, and we're, we want to be men and women of our word. Amen? We don't want to call in to work unless, unless it's really necessary. I'm not trying to say that it's never necessary, but you get what I'm trying to say. Right? But we can turn this into this thing that it wasn't intended to be, and it's because of my identity. I'm now the worker. I'm the hardest worker, and, and, and it's like now our life is consumed with it. I'm talking, I'm just talking about identity, right? I'm talking about identity and, and family. And even kids with sports will try to find an identity in our in playing sports. Some kids are better at sports than other kids. Y'all know what I'm talking like, I, I grew up playing sports. I love sports. I mean, to the point where if I'm not careful, sport will become a god in my life real quick. Because I grew up playing sports. I love sports. I love, I just love to watch athletic talent. All of that kind of stuff. It's got, like, some people are talented. I mean, I don't know. It makes a lot more sense as a warrior on the battlefield. But nevertheless, you can see it. Okay. And, but, but these kids are being groomed. And, and they will, all of their life, and even with my dad, I was trying to find some kind of identity. I'll use myself. It's kind of like you're psychoanalyzing. I'm psychoanalyzing myself. <laughs> Soulology. I'm just, I'm just trying to use myself as an example. But it's not just me. It's you too. This has affected you too in one shape, way, shape, or form. I need you to understand that. You can look at Matt Abair, Pastor Matt, say, oh, poor Pastor Matt. He was so mixed up. Okay, he was. But guess what? You too. <laughs> right? Come on, somebody. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so sometimes these kids are trying to find an identity. They want to make my father happy. They want to make my mother happy. I want to excel at these things. And sometimes these poor mamas, I, don't, I didn't plan on getting into all this, but sometimes these these moms are literally trying to make their daughter the head of the cheerleaders. That crazy stuff happens with all of that. Stories on Facebook about people killing themselves and all of because of these things, because they're bullied. And it's just like, what in the world is the wickedness of man? Lord, help us. Yes. Ends up being like a bunch of rudderless ships on, a, on an ocean just being tossed because there's no real identity. Because identity is supposed to be found in the fact that we're sons of God. Amen? Amen? But I want you to understand something, and this is important. Our flesh, which is the remaining part of us that is still affected by the fall, loves all these things I'm talking to you about. My flesh loves to be the hardest worker on the yard. Oh, I'm always going to run into somebody that can outdo me. But until he shows up, my flesh likes to be the hardest worker. My flesh likes to be the best nose guard in the Little League football. 
My flesh loves to get there. I'm not trying to say don't excel. I already made myself clear on that, but I'm saying my flesh loves recognition. Yes. Come on. Amen. Somebody help me out here. Amen. Because they give us recognition. And, and listen to me. A, 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 the flesh will also love a gospel that promotes those things. Amen. But a gospel that starts to chip away at it. And why would you want to chip away at it, Pastor? Because it stands between him and his Amen. glory. Yes. Because listen to me. If I'm getting glory, where's his glory? Right. You, you understand what I'm saying? He said, I'm not share my glory with another. And I'm not saying that there's ever anything wrong with getting a little slap on the back. You gotta kind of hit him a little bit higher nowadays. You gotta be careful. <laughs> and and that boy ain't never maybe won't hurt us from time to time. Okay, but you understand what I'm saying? We gotta be careful and we gotta start to catch on to these things. In a world that's struggling with identity, men that identify as women and vice versa, people that identify with the real Jesus are seen as weird because it results in a denial of self. While everyone else is being deceived to be to preserve to preserve self. Yeah. Does that make sense? In a world where everyone else is trying to preserve their self and their self-identity, it seems weird to be a true Christian. When that guy said that to me, he, he would no, he wasn't being ugly. I told him there and after I said, that dude, that dude is smart. Because he wasn't being ugly when he said that. He was telling the truth. I know. I spent enough time with him when his point was he might not have known how to string his sentence to where I really understood it clearly. What he was trying to say is, no, if you live for the real Jesus today and you speak for the real Jesus today, they're going to think you are, and I'm going to use a weirdo. They're going to think you're a weirdo. And you know, everybody says I'm good with him. And I just want to say this. Maybe we are, but... Without Jesus, we're not. And, and, and if our old self isn't dying and Jesus isn't being fashioned, then we're not okay with him. Right? The world is thrown into chaos. The church thrown into chaos. Family's thrown into chaos. And this is the end of my introduction. <laughs> I always just ask, would the real Jesus stand up? Would the real Jesus please stand up? Can I get a clear picture of the Lord because I need to know him? Because I really, really, really need to know my Father. I really need to know my father. John chapter 1 verse 18 in the King James Version, it says this. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. Now, I'm not going to expect you to go to each one of these. But look what the NASB says. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Now, but I would like you to go to the Amplified version on this because I want you to see this. All three use the word bosom. In the Amplified, it says this, no man has ever seen God at any time. The only unique son or the only begotten God. See, you, the translators are seeing something in the Greek text. <laughs> and what they're saying is that he is a the unique son. Because you see, the Old Testament says that Israel was his firstborn. The, the, the scripture also says that, that angels are sons of God. The scripture also calls Adam in, in, in one of the genealogies the son of God. And the scripture says that he gave power to you and I that believed on the name of Jesus to become sons of God. And so the scripture in the great text has become is seeing something that he's the only unique son. And in more than one way, he is truly the begotten of God. He was born of God. He was always God. He was the eternal son and the eternal word that, that, that came into this fleshly, earthly realm. But it was uniquely done in that he was literally born of God. But he wasn't just, he wasn't, just, he wasn't, look, the Jehovah's Witnesses say he was an angel. No, he wasn't an angel. He was God that became man. He was the God man. And in order for God to become man, he had to be born into an earthly vessel. And so he's the unique son of God in that he was begotten. And he is God of God. It says, who is in the bosom. It says he's or the only begotten God who is in the bosom. And then it says in the intimate presence of the father. He has declared him. The unique son has declared him. 
He has revealed him and brought him out where he can be seen. Jesus, the uniquely begotten son, has been manifest in human flesh so that he could make the father manifest for us. So that we could, so that he could declare the father in such a way that you and I could know him and become intimate yes. with him. He brought him out where he can be seen. He has interpreted him and he has made him known. I was counting the other day and I didn't count them all, but this is a, I feel confident about this statement. John's writings, which includes the gospel of John, first, second, and third John. I counted the word father where it was capitalized 110 times. John the beloved, John the, the disciple that Jesus loved according to his own admonition, talked about the father 110 times in his life. It was very prevalent on his heart and, and in his mind. You don't have to turn to these, but in Deuteronomy it says, the wife of your bosom. I'm talking about the word bosom. In Numbers 11 and 12, Moses said, did I conceive these people? That I give birth to them, and the King James says that I would be like a a nerd, a a a, 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 a how do you say a, a father that's breastfeeding these children. In the in the ESV it says that it says this: Did I conceive these people? Did I give them birth? That you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers. That's really the best description of, of, the, of the intimacy when a mother puts her baby to her bosom for feeding and nurture. The bosom is a place of closeness, intimacy, and protection. That make you feel weird, <laughs> you know, man. Like, you know, but, but but listen, it's talking about intimacy and it's talking about closeness. Now, the, now you can't pass this up. John thirteen and twenty three. Now there was leaning on Jesus's bosom. One of his disciples whom Jesus loved. John. John wrote the gospel. John talked about the Father. John explains to us that no man has ever seen God but the one that was in the bosom of the Father. And John, I believe, I've never seen it before like this, but I believe he's trying to he let us in on a clue. If you want to be intimate with the Father, you're going to have to really, really, really be close to the Son. You're going to have to get intimate. And John said, I find myself in the bosom of the son or laying on the bosom of the son so that I can know the father because no other person has ever really seen him like this. Amen. Amen. Through John, the Holy Spirit shows us that. He is the son of God for he is God born of God. He is the son of man for he is God born of man. And he is the only way that man can know God is through his son. God is my brother's father. And because of the self-denial of my brother, God has become my father too. And I cannot know our father except through my elder brother. His son is his beloved. And his beloved son is manifest the Father to a lost and dying world. And I want you to know that God the Father desires to see His Son because His Son glorifies the Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed, separate, holy. There is no other name that is holy. Father, you are holy. Jesus came to the earth to reveal to humanity that the Father is altogether different. He is altogether worthy. He is altogether holy. You know the word name means reputation and character. He says your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said this in John 17. He said, and you wouldn't have to turn there for sake of time, but he said, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. He goes on to say it in verse 6. This is John 17. He says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. But verse 5, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. 
He's saying my job is complete. You gave me these disciples. I've manifested you to them. Now take me back. I'm about to go to the cross. And allow me to have the glory that I had with you before I willingly came to do what you asked me to do. Right now, in the Father's presence, he looks to his right and he sees his only begotten Son. See, the eternal word that spoke the worlds into existence at one time wasn't in human flesh. He's the firstborn from the dead. And what that means is that now he's in a glorified body. Now when the father sees him, he sees his glorified son. And the Bible teaches us in the last two chapters of Revelation that he's still noticed as the lamb. And he bears the scars in his body. When the father looks to the right and he sees his son, he, 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 he loves his son. His son did what he asked. His son said what he's instructed him to say. And he sees those nail scarred hands. What, what greater love could a man have than he would lay down his life for his friends? Selflessness. Sacrifice. He sees his son. He wants to see his son, church. I, I, that's what I, one of the things I want you to know from this morning's message is that the, the father wants to see his son. And, and, and the question that we have to ask, do we belong to the father through the son? And if we belong to the father through the son, that means that we are not our own. Amen. The scripture says you've been, you're not your own. You've been oh, bought with a price. Hallelujah. The precious blood of a lamb. That was foreordained before the foundations of the earth. <coughs> he looks to his right and he sees his only begotten unique son. But in ages past, I want you to know something. He left that place of glory to become my brother so that he could teach me about our father. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. I want to say that again while they're loading it up. It, it, now he sees his only begotten unique son at his right hand. But in ages past, the son left that place where he was clothed in glory. And he came to the earth so that he could become my brother. And he wants to teach me about our father. Hebrews 2.14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Hebrews 2.17 Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He became like me in physical flesh so I could become like him renewed in spirit and I could become a partaker of his divine nature. His son brings him joy. His son brought his glory to this earth and in Numbers chapter 14 verse 21, we don't have to go there, I'm just going to say this, that jo that in the book of uh, that Joshua, it came forth through this through the ministry of Joshua that the Lord said this as surely as I live, the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. Now listen, we don't have time to really try to talk about that. I preached on it multiple times, but I'm here to tell you I don't think we can wrap our mind around that. The Lord says, and listen, this is in the time frame whenever they sent the spies into the land and they saw the giants and they're like, we can't beat them. And Joshua and Caleb are like, they're bread for us. If God be for us, who's going to be against us? He will give us the victory. And God's saying, it's true. God told Moses, he said this, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to pardon them. Now look, they didn't make it into the promised land. He just said, I'm not going to swallow the ground like I did for Achan and go ahead and kill them all right now. I'm not going to be the God of Ananias and Sapphira and kill them dead right now, New Testament, by the way. But instead, what I am going to do, I'll pardon them, but they're not making it into where I'm going, where I am. No, their, their bones bleached the, the, the Sinai Desert. 
Their bones became bleached in the sun of the Sinai Desert. They never made it to the finish line. They weren't even able to crawl across the finish line. They died on the other side because they didn't have faith. And they did not do what it was God called them to do, which was to trust him. Not to do it in their own strength. You're not going to beat Goliath in your own strength. Goliath comes out, David says, you come at me with spear and sword, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. The the Lord of the host of God's army. Hallelujah. He's looking for people that are going to that are going to walk with him, honor him, live for him, not live for themselves. Amen. He says, as surely as I live, says the Lord, the glory of the Lord will fill this earth. Now, I don't have time to really properly do that, but I'm here to tell you right now, we used to sing that, sing a song, your name, I don't even know how the words went, but it's like, there is, your name is above all other gods, right? I can remember I was having a conversation with somebody, and I'm like, duh. And then later, as we kept studying, we're like, oh, now we get it. We get it now, because we're looking back at the Old Testament, and even Israel, God's people, worship and false gods. Yes. And the world has been filled with the worship of false gods. And, and the, the world is now, it's all coming back again, even in the United States of America and across the world, worshiping false gods, creating God in their own image after their own likeness so that they can find them a God that they're willing to worship instead of seeing the God that reveals himself through his son and reveals himself through the biblical account and worshiping him. Instead, that's a plug for Romans 1. We're going to start Romans series Wednesday night, by the way. Instead, they're creating a God that they are willing to worship. And the earth has been filled with that. And God has a plan. And in his plan, he says, as surely as I live, my glory will fill this earth. Hallelujah. It may not look like it to people, but he's right on target. Hallelujah. He's right on time. He killed all that stuff with a flood, washed the earth, called a man named Abraham, created a nation called Israel, gave the world Jesus through Israel. Jesus died on the cross, and now he's creating his church, and one day he's coming back for a millennial reign, and the glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth. But in the meantime, let me tell you something, saints. You harbor the glory of God if you are converted. If you are saved this morning, the Bible says that the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. And Jesus said this, the same glory you have given unto me, I give unto them. Amen. The glory of God is in you. He, he, he sits and he looks at his right hand because he wants to see his son. And he sees his son. But I'm here to tell you what I'm trying to say to you is this. He wants to see his son in you. Amen. He wants to see his son in me. Joshua went on to say this. He said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Amen. Whether you're going to serve the gods on the other side of the river that your father served, or are you going to serve me? And what does that mean for you? I ain't got no statues in my yard. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. We've got to think a little bit more than that. Amen. How do we live our lives? Do we live our lives like our daddy did? Do we live our lives like our mama did? Do we live our lives like our friends in high school lived? Do we, come on, y'all get what I'm trying to say? He longs to look upon the earth and to see his sons bearing the image of his son. How else will this earth be filled with his glory unless his sons bear the image of his only begotten son? What does he see when he is looking for his son? What is he looking for? It says in Isaiah 66, To this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Jesus said that. Blessed are the poor in spirit, not haughty, not prideful, not puffed up, not thinking I got, I got what the world needs, not thinking I got what the church needs, not thinking I got what everybody needs. Look at me, recognize me. No, poor in spirit, I am dependent upon you, O oh Lord. I come to you as a servant, hallelujah, even though you see me as a son. Oh, no, that's scriptural. That's Philippians chapter 2. 
right there. That's Philippians chapter 2. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Though he were in the form of God, did not consider it something to be grasped to. But instead he lowered himself. He became a servant. So that he could die. And not just any death, but the death of the cross. Poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. He looks upon the earth to see his son. John 5 and 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is, in order to know the father, you're going to have to know the son. And in order to know the son, through the help of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to know the word of God. And if you're saying that I just don't have time, okay, I get it. You may live your whole human existence without really knowing your father. It's a possibility. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to be real. Do you, do, do you nor myself honestly believe that we'll ever really know the heart of the father if we have not through the help of the Holy Spirit understood the written word of God that reveals the living word of God? Amen. He listens to the conversations of men hoping to hear the voice of his son. I believe that. That's good. <laughs> He's looking on the earth, looking to see his son. He listens to the conversations of men, hoping to hear the voice of his son. You think that the Lord's okay whenever we talk the same way that the world talks? I'm just asking. It's just a thought. Jesus said this in John chapter 12 or 49. I have not spoken to myself, but the father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Paul said this in Galatians, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Wow. I can't get that verse out of my, out of my mind or out of my spirit because he's speaking to the church and he's saying, I'm like a woman in labor until Christ be formed in you. Until, until people see Jesus in you. That's, that's important. First John chapter 3 he said, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And look at this. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. The Corinthian letter says this. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. <clears throat> then I will welcome you. See, this is an Old Testament passage that's being quoted in the New Testament. The Old Testament people as a nation were going off and connecting themselves to places like Egypt and intermingling themselves with the people of the heathen nations. But in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is saying, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And it's not just talking about marriage, my friend. It's, it's, talking about, it's talking about closeness and intimacy with the world. What fellowship does light have with darkness? Yes. If you're in close, close intimate fellowship with darkness, it's going to affect you. Yes. Yes. The Apostle Paul said it. This is 2 Corinthians 6 and 17 and 18. He says, touch no unclean thing. He says, come out of their midst, be separate from them, touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Colossians 1.13, he delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and innocent. And the King James, harmless. The word is unmixed, as in metals. That you not have, that you not be an alloy, but that you be pure. Yeah. That your that your silver be removed of its dross. That your gold be removed of its impurities. That you not be a mixture of righteousness and unrighteousness. 
Amen. I, yeah, he's preaching on holiness. I sure am. I'm preaching on holiness because he said, be ye holy for I am holy. But I'm not preaching on holiness of you hunkering down and try to pull yourself up by your bootstrap and doing it on your own. I'm preaching a holiness that comes that because you can do what is right. You can live for the Lord. How are you talking about preaching? Because Jesus paid the price to defeat the powers of darkness, to de defeat the, the forces of evil. And so that you, through the grace of God, because of what he did at the cross can stand up hallelujah on the rock which is Christ Jesus and through the grace of God empowering you you can live a victorious existence as a Christian on this earth. Amen. He paid a high price and you can have it. He wants to see his son. He wants to hear the words of his son church. Praise God. He says that you may be blameless and innocent unmixed Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. You imagine when the father looks down there and looks for his son, he just sees lights lit up. All. Like, remember, I don't know what happened to him, but back when I was a kid, he used to have lightning bows. Maybe they're still somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. They're still here. They're just not going to live where they are. <laughs> but you can see them little lights blinking, right? They see the father looking down. He sees the little lights. There they are. Look at that. Look at that. All over the place. Praise God. I wonder, I, this is just a speculation. It's just hidden. I wonder if some lights are dimmer than others. I wonder if some lights, some people, some lights, man, I'm not talking. Look, some lights maybe look like real flame. Look at that bonfire. You know, you see some of these flares right on these gas plants and they'll light up the sky from miles away. Hallelujah, Lord. I want to be a flame like that, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm gonna be a light. I ain't live. Yo, that's weird. Yep, that's weird. Look at all that, Look at all that light right there. That's a weird. I love it. All right, this is my conclusion. Normally, I call the musicians up, but right now, I'm just gonna say, let's just let me just say this, and then I'll worship the Lord. And if anybody needs prayer, we'll pray. Amen. In this relationship, my brother sits me down. You know, I haven't been able to shape my this thought from my mind all week. You can't really get a better illustration to describe what I'm trying to say in this message than this. My elder brother is Jesus, and I am an adopted son. Five times in the New Testament, the terminology adoption as sons is used. He, Jesus, is the natural born son of God. He is my elder brother, and I am the younger. And you know, he knows my father. He's a grown up. <laughs> and he spent time with him. He was in his bosom. And he learned him. And he's, and he's lived this life with him. And, and, he, and he sees me, his younger brother. He's like, yeah, let me come over here. Let me sit down and talk to you about our father. <laughs> I've been knowing him for a long time. Know him? I know what he dislikes, and I want to teach you about it. I want, to, I want to minister his heart to you so that you can understand our Father. I am the younger, and he knows my Father, and I desperately need to know my Father. And my older brother, he sees my struggles in the relationship that I'm having with my Father, or our Father. So he sits me down and he teaches me the things that I don't know. But it's those things that he has learned from his closeness to our father. And he speaks to me the words he heard from the bosom of his father. And through his word and the intimacy I have with the spirit through the cross, I learn what pleases my father. And I just put two little things here. I want to say this. The Father is pleased with his beloved. <laughs> That's Jesus. He said, this is my beloved son. In him, I am well pleased. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is transfigured before them. And all of a sudden, Peter says, I got a great idea. Let's build three tabernacles. One for Elijah, one for Moses. Because you remember Moses and Elijah showed up. And we'll build one for you. And all of a sudden, a voice spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. 
We're getting so caught up in all the things that even Peter, the one that died upside down on the cross, getting caught up. So number one, I just want you to know that uh, this is something that, 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 that Jesus wants to teach us. What we will learn from the word, the father is pleased with his beloved. And this is something so profound. You know, I felt like the Lord got through in my spirit. I just added this this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah said this. It pleased the father to bruise him. Yeah. What does that mean? Wow. Why would he do that if he was already pleased with the son? I think sometimes in the church we put more emphasis on human beings than what we should and not put enough emphasis on him. But I'm going to tell you right now, if it pleased the Father to bruise the beloved, what does that say about you, my friend? Yes. He loves you. Yeah. He loves you and he wants to see his son in you. Amen? Amen. 